Good morning. I am Dennis Schmidt, the pastor of Dubuque Community Church, and the title of today's message is Final Instructions. We have been discussing for the last number of weeks the final days of the Lord Jesus Christ's earthly ministry. Our main focus on this point has been the resurrection from the tomb after the third day. And we have been looking at all the overwhelming evidence that Jesus uh, uh, gave to his disciples and all those around him, the, the overwhelming evidence that, so that there would be no doubt uh, that, that he had won complete victory over sin and the devil and death itself. But Jesus, at this point, also made it clear that he was not going to stay here forever with them in his bodily form. But he was going to return to the Father. Well, this caused a lot of sadness and fear in the disciples' hearts. But he assured them that this would not be a bad thing, but would be a wonderful thing for them because he was not going to leave them as orphans. But actually the opposite was going to happen that when he went back to heaven, he was going to send the Holy Spirit and that now he would be with them in a more personal way than he had ever been with them before. And it would be more beneficial for him that he would leave and the Holy Spirit would come than if, if he would just stay. Well, this is what he told them. And he said in John 14, 16 through 19, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. Another counselor, he said. And if you look at that word, it's parakletos. It means comforter or instructor, advocate, somebody who advocates for you. Uh, some kind of an intercessor who prays for you and intercedes for you uh, between, God, between mankind and the Father. And this would be an, uh, an additional guide sent by God. And the reason for that he was going to be sending the Holy Spirit, because as Jesus came, he came as a human being so that he could die. God cannot die, but the human form of God can die, and he came so he could die on the cross to pay the punishment for our sins. But because of he was in a human body, that limit, limited him to being at one place at one time. And that was restricting God's work. So he said, I'm going to be sending, in verse 17, the spirit of truth. And boy, if there's something we need in our confusing, mixed-up world not right now is so the, the truth, the real truth of what's going on. And when you have the Holy Spirit, you, it's like the, the, your eyes are opened and uh, the scales come off and you can see what's really going on. And it says, this spirit of truth, one who's going to disclose what's truly going on, and notice all the different names uh, when, we had, when I was just saying to you about intercessor, advocate, co comforter, uh, helper, uh, en enlightener, all these things. And this is because the Holy Spirit is God. And when you begin to try to explain all of the many gifts and blessings that come from God, there is no one word that can actually cover them all. And, and so that, that's why he has all these different names. And he said the spirit of truth. And then he says this, that the world cannot accept him. The Holy Spirit is spirit and he is truth. And in this lying, mixed up, confused world, they cannot receive something that is so foreign to them. It's like when the Holy Spirit speaks, it's like he's speaking in a foreign language. And so they can't accept him. And it says they neither see him nor know him. And uh, they, they can't see him. And you know the world, to the world, Jesus is a, is, a, is a dead savior. They don't realize how alive he is. And people all the time tell me, I can't believe in anything I can't see. 
and I say, well, do you believe in electricity? And they say, yeah. I say, can you see that? No, but you can see the effects of it. And that's what we, we can see with God also. And it says they can't see him or know him. They can't really experience him because it's a supernatural gift from God to experience him. But then I love this, but it says, but you know him. You who have been called by God, you who have been given supernatural awareness of this Holy Spirit living inside of you, you, each and every one of us, will know him. And then the last thing it says there, and he will be in you. And this is the most wonderful part of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells within each and every one of us individually. He's with me all the time. He's with you all the time if you've accepted Jesus Christ. And he's with all these other people all over the world all at the same time. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it's not on the screen, says, uh, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, a place where the Holy Spirit dwells, who is in you, he's in us, and whom you've received from God. The Holy Spirit is a gift from God. Well, Jesus continues, he said, I will not leave you as orphans. I'm not going to abandon you. I'm not going to just take off and leave you without any help or any guidance or any direction. And uh, he says, I will come to you. And that's what's wonderful you know, many times, and I've said it myself, I say, when I found the Lord. Well, the Lord had knew, knew me, and he, it wasn't like I was seeking something. He was seeking me more than I was looking for him. But at some point, I finally had the uh, supernatural blessing to get to know the Lord. He says, I will come to you. And then he says, before, the lo before long, and he, this is right before he was to suffer and die for us, the world will not see me anymore. This fallen, confused world does not recognize the, the reality that Jesus is still alive and still working in all of our lives. They will not see me, but you will. And then the last verse says, And because I live, you will live also. Because of the power of the Holy Spirit working in us, we will have supernatural life, a, a life that would never was available to us before Jesus Christ came in. You walk in supernatural victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, with that as our foundation, uh, we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at these final instructions, which was the title I gave you today, that was given by Jesus and is recorded in the book of Acts. So we're going to start right out at the very first verse in Acts 1.11. And uh, it says there, Acts 1.11, verse 1, In my former book, Theopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Well, the reason he said in my former, former book is if we spent a lot of time in the book of Luke. And Luke, it, the disciple, who are, he, he is the author of the book of Luke. But he also wrote the book of Acts, which is where we're at today. And he said in his former book, he wrote all about what Jesus had began to do and to teach. Well, by the way, you know what? It says all that Jesus... I love it that people say that history is all of his story, the story of Jesus Christ. All that Jesus began to do and to teach. Well, what did he do? Well, he healed the sick. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. He gave sight to the blind. He gave hearing to the deaf. He gave deliverance from demon oppression and raised the dead. That's, kind of, that's what he did. That's a pretty good list. And you know, in John 14, 11, it's not on the screen, but Jesus says, believe me when I tell you that, that I and the Father are one, or if you can't believe that, at least believe the evidence of the miracles that you see me doing. 
So uh, Jesus is saying, uh, if you can't just believe my sp what I'm telling you, believe what I am doing. So it says, all that he began to do and to teach. And praise God, what did Jesus teach us? He taught us that we have a loving Heavenly Father. Nobody understood that before. And how to treat your neighbor and what to, how to set your priorities, where your treasure should be. Oh, he taught a lot of wonderful things, life-changing things for each and every one of us. But then the next verse, it says, he did all these things, verse 2, until the day he was taken up to heaven. Well, this is the break between the Old Testament book of Luke and the New Testament book of Acts where or not the uh, Luke was not an Old Testament book, but the, the story, the life of Jesus before he left for heaven. And now as we go into Acts, it's going to be his new life uh, after he leaves heaven and all the work that's going to be done in the church here in Acts. And so this until the day, uh, this is the breaking point be between the book of Luke and the book of Acts until the day he was taken up to heaven and that's where we're going to focus our our time the rest of our time today the ascension of the Lord Jesus into heaven and uh, that's coming up real quick now that we will celebrate that after the resurrection Sunday and it says that taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen and what we really need to remember is that the Holy Spirit has always been working. If you go clear back, I think it's Genesis 2 or 3, it talks about the Holy Spirit was there at the creation of the world. And all the way through the books of the Bible, the Holy Spirit is working all the time. So Jesus is speaking, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, he's giving them these instructions to mankind. Uh, to the apostles he had chosen. That's who he's speaking to, these people, these called out ones, who we are. Uh, each one of us are those call, part of the called out part of the church. So it says, after his suffering, and again now it's talking about after his resurrection, after his crucifixion, betrayal, death, and burial, uh, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He revealed himself to them to absolutely, positively erase any doubt in their minds whether Jesus had risen from the dead. And the reason was these men were going to have to face death themselves. And the only way they could do that victoriously is to realize unequivocally that Jesus Christ had rose from the tomb and that they too will have their resurrection. He showed them he was alive. He was no mirage or ghost or, uh, you know, all these silly stories that come, people come up with, but they realized that he was truly alive. And we're going to talk about that. And it says that he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. You know, again, these silly stories, people come, they said they, they, they seen a cloud that looked like the shape of Jesus, and so they started believing that Jesus rose from the tomb, all this. No, for 40 days, 40 days, that Jesus appeared to them over and over and over again in all kinds of different situations. And, uh, you know, I said 40 days today, and, and we are coming up on, quickly on the celebration of the ascension of Jesus. And what did he talk about? Not about the weather, not about what's going on. He gave them instructions for building his church here on the earth. Hallelujah. And then he, uh, Luke is going to tell us about one of those occasions while he was eating with them. Well, this one had some particular importance because there's a command that he's about to give them. But if you've heard these messages week after week, Jesus spent a lot of time eating with his disciples. He's sitting there in close fellowship with them after his resurrection. 
Uh, this was his way of showing them how real he was, how alive he was. They're sitting right at the table eating lunch with, with Jesus Christ. So, uh, you know, over and over again, he was showing how close his fellowship was with them. But he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the, for the gift my father promised, which you heard me speak about. Well, this was not a suggestion. You know, sometimes people say the Ten Commandments are not ten suggestions. They're commandments. And this was a command too. Don't leave Jerusalem until uh, you receive the gift that, I, that you heard me speak about. Well, if you remember at the beginning of the message there, uh, we were talking about in John chapter 14 about Jesus instructing them about receiving the Holy Spirit of God. And he's saying, don't leave Jerusalem. And by the way, uh, a human flesh would be to leave Jerusalem. They just murdered Jesus here just very shortly ago. Then maybe there'd be a good time to move somewhere else. But he said, don't you leave till that promise comes. And he says this, until you heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Well, that word baptize is a very important word. It means to be completely immersed in. And what they would use that word for in the, in the Old Testament Greek or in the New Testament Greek is that they would uh, take cloth and dip it deep into uh, water which had uh, blueberries cooked into it and they would change their clothes to a beautiful blue color. So it would, it would literally change the color and yet it would be somewhat the same. But it was that word they would baptizo these, these garments. But you're going to be baptized. You're going to be fully immersed in the third person of the Trinity, the, the mighty power of the Holy Spirit. So it says, so all this is starting to sink in. And so when they met together again, the next verse, it said, they asked him, Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And you know, this is one of the things most Christians do. We make a mistake of, of thinking too small. When God's involved, we need to think big. Uh, I used to pray for my church. Now I pray for the churches all over the world because God's in control of all of them. Here they are. They're only worried about restoring the kingdom to Israel. Well, the Lord tells us that someday that all the people of the earth will be, uh, there will be a restored kingdom in Israel at the end of the days. And it'll be, people will be going there because King Jesus is going to have his throne there. But for now, God is going to be working through his spiritual building, the church. And, uh, you know, they were just thinking way too small. And this spiritual kingdom was going to affect the whole world in a way that that small little kingdom of Israel would not be able to touch them. And here's just one fact. They tell me that there is 2.38 billion Christians in the world. Now that's impact. And it says... Uh, are you going to restore the kingdom? And here's what he said in verse 7. He said to them, It's not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority. You know, God will tell us everything we need to know, but he doesn't tell us everything we want to know. And I had, I had a friend that used to say, well, You know what? That, that information is above my pay grade. God knows it. And he will decide when it will happen. He does not have to tell us. But here's the great part. But you, <laughs> you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Each one of us receive dunamis power. And that's when you see that word power. It's the word dunamis, 
And when Alfred Nobel had created something called, he, it was, he didn't know what to name it, but they could move rocks that were never able to be moved before, he called it dynamite. And that's where this dunamis, the power. We have dynamite power in our lives to change all our old habits and things that have tripped us up over the years. We can explode them out of the way when we have Holy Spirit power coming on us. And, you know, one of the things, too, what will be some of the results? And once in a while when I'm in church and often when I'm worshiping the Lord, I might get goosebumps or I just, I mean, I just have a joy and a blessing. And I know that comes from the Holy Spirit, and I love that. But the main reason that we're getting this Holy Spirit power is so that we can be witnesses in all Judea and Samaria and the end of the earth so that we can give by changed lives a testimony. You know, they, they, there was said one time that uh, preach the gospel all the time and use words if necessary. Uh, no, we should live in such a way that people will know that we are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we'll be witnesses. And you start out right in your hometown you spread out wherever you go and it, it says all the way to the ends of the earth well jesus is kind of shooting shooting big here uh, that's quite a prediction for a little group that's only about 120 people and by the way it would have never happened if Jesus would have never rose from that tomb. The people, the, this worldwide message would not have spread around if there was a dead Savior, that's for sure. Well, it says after this, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sights. And this is what we call ascension of Christ into heaven. He didn't suddenly disappear and like, what happened to him? Where is he gone? No, they saw him be lifted up into heaven until a cloud uh, hid him from their sight. You know, when I was a young man, the blue angels used to come to Dubuque and uh, this area. And one came one day and back then they let the jets come closer to you. This thing come right over top of our heads. And he went up and he, he pulled it up and he went straight up. And he, I remember he was spinning and spinning and going up and going up and going up. And he got a, became a smaller dot and a smaller dot. And finally he was gone. And I always think about that as when Jesus went up into heaven. Well, he goes up and it says the disciples there, they're looking intently up into the sky and at where he was going. And suddenly two men dressed in white, stood beside them. Well, I think about the two men dressed in white at the tomb of Jesus at the resurrection. They were angels, and I believe these two were angels. But they said, men of Galilee, verse 11, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him going into heaven. Jesus is going up to heaven, but he's coming back again someday. And he said, what do you stand here looking up into heaven for? What are you hoping he's going to come back? Or what do, you, what do you think you're going to do? He's coming back. Matthew 24, 45 through 46, not on the screen, said, that, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of his servants in his household to give their food at the proper time. We are followers of Christ. We are to give spiritual food to the people around us. It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Well, it tells us, then they returned to Jerusalem from, from the hill called the Mount of Olives. They went back to Jerusalem uh, just like Jesus told them, go back, and they went back out onto the Mount of Olives, just like they were told. Well, remember we we're talking today about final instructions before Jesus left the earth. One of the things that when they went back to the Mount of Olives, uh, where Jesus had taken from, had left, uh, we, we need to realize that if we're really wise, we're going to follow Jesus' final instructions that he gave to his disciples. And that is to be witnesses by the way we live, 
to all those around us that people can tell that we truly believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and we need to be found as faithful servants when our master returns. We pr I pray this would be so. Well, because this is the last Sunday of, of the, the month, or the first Sunday of the month, excuse me, I want to encourage you, if you are still in quarantine, you can't go to church, you can't be part of a communion service, uh, Jesus uh, left us uh, with a, a ceremony we call the Lord's Supper, where we remember what Jesus Christ did. He instituted it. Jesus created this so that we could remember every day the great sacrifice Jesus made for us. Well, if we don't do that, we will begin to forget what he has done for that. We're very forgetful, especially when it didn't cost us anything. So what I want to encourage you to do is get out your Bibles and get to Matthew 26, 26 through 28, where it's recorded, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. And then when you do that, have some bread, and uh, in your, in any kind of bread or anything that you need to use, and give that bread to, to each person in your group, and then uh, challenge each other, remind each other that when Jesus gave his body, he gave it over to, to be whipped, to be beat, beaten. He had spikes driven through his hands and his feet, and he did all this so that you could be forgiven for your sins. And then the next verse, 27, Then he took cup, the cup, gave thanks, and it offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. And take a cup of juice. Uh, it can be grape juice. It can be Kool-Aid. It can be whatever. And uh, give that to each person and have them drink of that cup. But while they're drinking of it, as they're getting ready to drink of it, Remember that Jesus gave his very blood for you so that you could be completely, totally forgiven for all of your sins. Well, I want to challenge you to do that. If you're still in quarantine, you can't go to church, you can't be part of a communion service with other believers, to do that right in your homes, and that will, that will make this, communion, or this church service extra special for you and the reason I know that is because I do this in my own home with my own children and grandchildren and there are very special times when we have our own private communion service and I pray very soon though now everyone will be back in the church and we can all have our communion services together well God bless you today and may the Lord bless you richly in all that you do in Jesus name amen